Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, the, the detailed micro work that we've been discussing this afternoon at the interface of climate change and inequality is a much more comfortable zone for us. Um, but sometimes uh, one gets put into situations and, and into policy discussions and, and you cause to reflect upon the, the bigger picture issues around sustainability and growth and poverty and inequality. Um, and uh, yeah. And in these discussions, we've, we have the, the climate shock coming through and the need to ad adapt and respond to the climate uh, change and the cl climate emergency, really. Uh, at the same time, we've had COVID. And we had it before the, all of this, well, before COVID, there was a very rich discussion, an increasingly rich and textured discussion around the fact that, certainly in the African context, but in many parts of the world, uh, growth was leaving lots of people behind. It wasn't inclusive. Uh, and um, and it certainly wasn't adjusting naturally and to climate change. Um, and uh, th then COVID hit, uh, and um, we've we've been involved, all of us on the paper, in discussions. Then uh, trying emerging post COVID, as well as the the climate discussion and climate commitments are are binding, becoming more and more binding and a need for a response. Uh, and what's, what's, very, uh, what's making us very anxious is that there seems to be this, this um, the perceived need in the policy space in every country, we need to get growth going again. We need to get, and, and it's like an old discussion in developing countries that, okay, Let's stimulate growth and everything will follow. But there's a mismatch then between the historical discussion and the, this new discussion. Um, and it's, 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 it's very anxiety uh, producing. On the one hand, there's the urgency of the discussions around sustainability, climate change, climate breakdown. And linked into that, if you just stay in the climate change set, there's a big discussion about degrowth, post-growth, uh, et cetera, um, that, that doesn't seem particularly well linked to our discussions about how, exactly how the more, more sophisticated and subtle links between economic growth, poverty, and inequality, and how do they interact with each other, particularly in the African context. Um, and... Uh, and that's been the big issue. But on the other hand, you've got uh, Sir Nicholas Stern pitching up at the World Economic Forum and every possible forum saying, look, this climate rupture is, the, is, is at last the opportunity for us to, to start doing things right, to, to look to inclusive growth, to restart, in a sense, to use his language. Right? So he's posing a much more uh, virtuous link and, and the one that links back to what was being recognized in the past. And it's pressing that we actually think about that and think about what are the possibilities in that regard. We know historically that if we just restart the old growth, we're going to get the, the old impacts if we're lucky post COVID and with climate change. And we won't be addressing the climate change issue. Uh, in Africa, it's a particularly um, important issue. We, have eight, we will have 85% of the world's poor. Um, we, we've, got a, we've had a very sluggish uh, response, poverty response to economic growth. Um, and uh, and there, there's other shocks on the horizon as well. And we're not a, a very resilient continent the bottom end of the income distribution 
suffers from the shocks. So we, we've embarked on this exercise uh, to, to think again about what can we learn from the relationship between growth, poverty, and inequality in, that has been thought about. The whole history of development economics has grappled with this issue. But uh, Francois Bourguignon and, and Chico was talking about this yesterday, put this back on, on the agenda with the, with the so-called growth, inequality, and poverty triangle, which is, is not a it's not really an identity, it's a framework. It's a call to look at the texture of what's going on and the interrelationships between these two. So we've embarked on this exercise. And in a sense, it's, it's, it's generously put, it's work in progress, okay? So in some senses, we're, we're, um, we're provoking you and in, pulling you into the program because it's not that easy to actually deal with this. But we've tried to do We've tried to do something. Um, that uh, that that can get us on our way and then you can help us take it further. So thanks. So this uh, is is the famous uh, elephant diagram of uh, Branko Milanovic. And but it's 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 we've put some things on here that we think are very important. Uh, do you know how the diagram works? I won't review the diagram, right? Give me some head nods or something. Yes, it's late in the day. Thank you. Uh, keep the bottom 50% of, uh, of world income distribution captured 12% of the total growth. So the returns to growth, 12% of the returns to growth go to the bottom 50%. And the top 1% captures 27% of the growth. Uh, and this is in the context of a diagram that's about the changes in real incomes. That doesn't mean there haven't been increases in incomes at the bottom end here. That's what the diagram shows, and a squeeze in the middle, and then very sharp income growth at the very top end. But that's a very unequal uh, situation. And the key point is, the rich, is the fact that the growth it is not trickling down that effectively there's some return there's been some poverty reduction we're not trying to deny that so what we did um, and this is Rwani one the co-author working on steroids we've made a life of misery on the data side um, uh, we, we overlaid on the, this is the same graph we just created it ourselves and then we put Africa's share of uh, of the distribution so where does Africa sit in this world graph and it sits at the bottom. In 1990, the share, uh, Africa's share was, was here. So you can see it's already high in the bottom percentiles and then declines. Now by 2016, it's got way higher at the bottom, completely dominating the, the dynamics at the bottom of the distribution are dominate. That's the African reality that we're talking about in this growth, poverty and inequality nexus globally. That must be important when one's thinking about global growth. Uh, and so that's why we did this. And this is not working well. So that's, that's the, the, the global framework. Uh, it's, that's not to deny that the continent has seen some reduction in poverty between 1980 and 2017. Um, uh, and in terms of the growth inequality of poverty triangle, Poverty reduction seems to have been greater in countries that observed a reduction in inequality. And that's fully in line with the Bourguignon Triangle framework. That's what it's trying to get us to think about. Um, and more frequent in countries that, that uh, observe positive economic growth. So this is not an exercise that's trying to deny the importance of growth. It's trying to focus on the texture of growth and what makes growth uh, sustainable, lower poverty, a lower uh, inequality, which in turn enables growth to be more inclusive. Okay, and we do have a very high uh, inequality part of the world, and that's a key part of the reason why uh, Africa's got such a low uh, growth poverty elasticity, is the actual texture of our economies and societies. Okay, so we've also done 
a lot of a lot of data work that actually looks at the African um, nations, countries, and looks at their initial inequality and and looks at the change in the inequality, the change in their growth, the 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 change in um, in poverty, and this is. This is almost like the opposite approach to a cross-country regression. This is like, let's get all the data we can get about the countries and, and see what we can see about the historical period. We're trying to learn the lessons that we have to learn about uh, the period from 1980 to 2017. And we've got many, many of these, and we had a big fight amongst each other as to which of these we we're going to put. And you probably can't see them see this but uh, maybe you can but uh, it's just it's just to give you an example of, of the methodology we've used where we're taking we're collating all these data and we're taking a look at it and so we've divided this graph into initial Gini between 0.32 and 4 so low inequality if you like and then this is sort of middle inequality and it's a bit arbitrary to use Chico's word about how they started out their story uh, yesterday and then this is high inequality and then we're looking at the change in poverty and the change in growth, in the growth rates. Okay, so it's just one way of, of, of looking at at least initial inequality and, it's, and how it seems to mediate the situation. And it's notable, well it's notable maybe not to you, but uh, it, it is notable when you get the presentation and look at it. Uh, this is the change in poverty uh, being zero, right? If you're above the line, your poverty is increasing. If you're both below the line, your poverty is decreasing. And this is the low inequality, initial inequality, if you like, right? The, in, in those uh, contexts. And what do you see? You see that there's no country there, there's no data point w in which the change in, in poverty goes up. Even for negative growth rates, he has, he has growth rate of zero, right? even for negative growth rates. And it's a complicated story, and we're not trying to make it simpler than it really is, because we've got uh, countries where the actual change in growth, whether it's negative or positive, increased inequality or decreased inequality, those are the light and the dark dots, etc., etc. And it's not so simple there. But the key point is that if you've got a low base inequality, it means you've got the base to build the society. Um, that's, it's not exactly, the, so if you move then to the high inequality situation, it's not exactly the same. Uh, uh, it's, there, there are a number of countries that actually had increases in poverty with any given growth rate. And that's the key point. That we'd, which, so we're trying to tell these, these stories. Um, I can't show you a graph for each of those stories, but I promise you there is one. Uh, here's, some, here's some findings though. So this is, the, this is the finding I chose to speak to. Countries with the lowest initial inequality experienced a decline in poverty and never experienced an increase in poverty even when economic growth was negative. Uh, countries with the lowest level of initial poverty, so initial poverty counts too. If you've got low initial poverty, it's also a sign that you've actually got resources to cope with whatever and hopefully to get into a growth process. And mostly they do not experience an increase in inequality nor poverty off, a, off that low base. And this independently of changes in GDP. So there's, there are graphs about that. So in Africa, the nature of economic growth and the initial levels of both poverty and inequality condition the sustainability and unsustainability of growth processes going forward. That's not earth shattering took us an incredible amount of time to do this sort of stuff, but uh, you can see the exercise we're embarking on, right? So there's the global context and how does Africa fit into that? There's country specific stuff and, um, and there's some lessons and I've stated the most, most of the key lessons. Um, and so, uh, well, let me just restate them. Um, going back to old strategies of reigniting growth will not produce the expected results. Well, it will produce the expected results that we expect, but won't, uh, won't actually generate the sustainable societies that are being demanded of us. 
and seeking growth without distributive concerns will fail to address the, the objective of reducing poverty. Okay, and then you've got the imperative of climate action that makes a business as usual approach to economic growth um, completely unlikely to succeed. Initial levels of inequality are really important. Uh, same initial levels of poverty. Well, uh, wealth inequalities are on the rise, and this is not very heartening. It's going to make the whole process harder if we just consider the business as usual model. So identifying how growth is distributed across the population in real time. If we want to go forward and acknowledge the fact that, okay, we do need to get uh, activity increasing, we have to start understanding the texture of that growth. That seems to be the key, and that's where we think we should proceed. But actually, we've just given you enough for you to tell us what to do. Thank you.